many people here in Uganda who never heard the gospel. In different villages, not only in the town, because people say that they go to villages and preach in them. Surprisingly, they don't. Gladly receive the gospel. The true gospel of Christ. Good Friday. There are very many people out there who have lost hope. The I thought is that immediately the village is much more receptive than the city, especially when we go out and preach the gospel to them. They have never been preached to. There are supposed to be thousands of people preaching the true gospel here in Uganda. Where are they? This mission trip was interesting, captivating, motivating, fantastic, encouraging, uplifting, precedent setting, inspiring, eye opening, life changing, fascinating, amazing, a great learning experience. Well, for over four years we have been working in Uganda, but we have never been outside of the capital city. We've just been preaching the gospel inside Kampala itself. And we had heard much about the villages, about their receptivity, whether if we go outside Kampala to preach in the villages, they'll be more receptive and they'll be more interested to hear what we have to say. So here was our plan. So we decided to go outside our comfort zone and to leave the capital city to go preach the gospel in a village of Uganda, in northern Uganda, called Pader District. The northern Ugandans speak a lot of English, the Acholi people, the Luo people, and so on. So we wanted to go to a place where they spoke very good English and also a place which here in Kampala we met many of those people and they turned out to be very receptive and interested in the gospel. But we only wanted to take a few people from our church to go and preach the gospel and we didn't want to exhaust all of the church to go and do it, not certain of what would happen. So we just took a group of 12 soul winners from our church including my brother John and I, the preachers in the church, uh, and we went up there with our 14 soul winners in total six women and eight men. We had this great plan of going to northern Uganda. God gave us this really awesome opportunity to be able to go and preach the gospel to all these people in the north. And I wanted to see what your initial ideas were about going to this place. First, let me ask Winnie. She was the architect of this plan uh, and this idea. So what made you get the idea of going on a mission to northern Uganda, Winnie? I was really feeling bad for my family members that they are going to hell because no gospel has reached them. No one has preached the gospel to them because I know that everyone in my home district have never heard the gospel except two or three of my siblings, the one I stay with. So like, I, every day I live and every day I hear the preaching about soul winning, I could really feel my soul is vexed. How can I, how can I make the gospel to reach my family? How can I make them to hear the gospel? We've never been in a mission trip as a church. It was the first time we organized a mission trip going somewhere uh, in the village for preaching the gospel for um, some amount of days. And when my friend Winnie told me about the trip to her family's house, I felt like it was a good idea because I'll be exposed to a village area preaching the gospel and because we think that people in the village are more receptive than the ones in the town. Winnie approached me and told me that uh, they have an idea of traveling to Pade and like preach to our family members so I told her that I was interested. I was so inquisitive about it being a, a, a rural area whether people would people know English that side or not. And then she said uh, Padere is a good place because people know English they can speak clear English so when she said that I was really excited I'm like wow if they speak English that side then it, it's going to be a very good soul winning opportunity. I went soul winning with Winnie and Winnie informed me about going to Padel to soul win there and we preached to their family members and uh, I didn't take her serious and I was like we shall go anytime so this year in April my sister told me that we were going to go to Padel. Winnie told me one time that uh, she wanna go to Padel to a village to preach the gospel to the family and friends and uh, everyone else in the city and I was uh, I was interested, I wanted to go because I wanted to know also how 
soul winning is in the, in the village to see if people are receptive or people are just like in the town. I wanted really to experience a new place because we've been preaching in Kapala for a long time. And uh, we've been hiding ourselves in Kapala for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to experience and go and preach the gospel somewhere else, okay. like in the villages. So the first thing when I heard about going to Fader that I thought is that immediately almost everyone in Kampala tells me that the village is much more receptive than the city. And they'd say that if you went to the village, people there would basically receive you like an angel of God, even like Jesus Christ. So I was excited to go there to see if that was actually the case or if there was going to be just like in Kampala, so everywhere else, the same amount of labor that has to be performed in order to be able to see the kind of biblical results that we're looking for. Another thing I knew about Pader, because of the fact that people in Kampala who are from northern Uganda have a higher emphasis and a love for education, is that the people there are generally going to be more educated than certainly other villages that you'll find throughout Uganda. I wanted to also go, because they were also going to preach. I just wanted to preach in a village, because we always preach in Kampala, so I said let me take the opportunity. So I tag along. It was from uh, Winnie uh, who came and approached me and she was like, are you going to accompany me such that uh, we go to our village and uh, we also help uh, to preach the gospel to the family members because uh, they, are not, they are not safe. The time she told me, yeah, I really felt it good. Reason being because it is our desire after knowing the truth. The Bible says once you know the truth, it's like a candle that you set on the hill that everyone should know. So you cannot light a candle and you put it under the table. So I definitely I told her, yeah, I'm motivated and I'm willing. So she wanted someone who can speak naturally to preach the gospel to the mother, especially the mother, and some few members of the family who don't know English. About them being receptive, Actually, I didn't know, but what I, I had in mind is that they speak good English and they will understand it truth. Apadero is comprised of English-speaking persons, at least for the most part, because the northerners almost everywhere speak English, so the place will be so much receptive, especially when we go out and preach the gospel to them. They will understand what we uh, give out to them in regard to the gospel. We have a philosophy, which you can call a Great Commission philosophy, that whenever the gospel is preached in an area, it should not just be the, the gospel being preached to people, but rather we should also extend the furtherance of the Word of God to those people. We should not just explain to them what the Bible says about how to go to heaven, but as Jesus said, we should baptize them and teach them to observe all things whatsoever Christ commanded, at least as is so much possible in a short time frame. And so we have a philosophy to preach the gospel and baptize new believers and teach them the Word of God even on a short-term mission trip and that's what we really wanted to materialize in this mission trip. In order to travel here in Uganda, of course, like most places, there are many ways of traveling to other places. We as our ministry don't have a lot of resources, so what we decided to do was use what we consider to be the cheapest method of getting up to northern Uganda, and that is to go by public bus. As we were traveling over to northern Uganda, there was something very interesting that I noticed on the bus, and that was that we, all of us, for the most part, were reading the whole way. But there were other things that you might have noticed on this trip up to northern Uganda. What were some uh, ideas that you had as you were going and maybe some experiences that you had that were new or something that was interesting to you? When traveling, I experienced something great like reading because I've never read a book when I'm traveling. I always sleep traveling a long distance, but this time all the way along I was reading and listening to him. So it was a great experience to me. I did not feel any headache because when I travel long distance, I always have that serious headache with me. But this time, I did not feel that headache because of the The trip to Padere actually took a longer amount of time than I've ever spent in a bus that I can remember in my life. And it was actually, to me, not something that took, seemed like it took a long time because of the fact that whatever I do for Christ, 
I always redeem the time, and whenever we're going to do things for the Lord Jesus, really the time seems to fly by very, very speedily. This whole life itself is but a vapor. It doesn't really take very much time. So in the bus, we actually, uh, to me, appeared to just simply be there for really just a few minutes because of the fact that we were I was reading the whole time, and we were all enjoying the company of each other on our way to go do what Jesus commanded us to do. Around Kampala we have so many false teachers, like in corners, on the roads, and highways, even at homes, in compounds, and everywhere. So that day, while we were traveling, I was so surprised to see a preacher, a false preacher on the bus, because before we set off, there was this Nigerian man who stood up to preach to us. The good things this face will be led upon to him from now. Daddy will decree and declare that it will prosper. Let the blessedness in give you, as you said it in the book of Acts of Apostles. Accompany these hands as they give. Let men give unto their bowls. May situations and occasions come. The mouth was closed, the eyes were closed, and he was talking since he didn't want people to recognize who this person is. But because we know the truth, we know what the Bible says, we just knew he's a false person. Uh, because of his species. At uh, the end of his speech, he said, he, this is the best time for you now to bring money. Because if you want to go to increase for you, you have to sow the seed. When you plant the seed, it is grow, it's going to grow more. It was humorous with this false teacher on the way there because right as soon as he was finishing up, he of course wanted to describe how he was begging for money. His clever story was that back in the church which he runs or he's a part of called the Soul Winners International which is the Soul Hunters International they have a group of like 17 elderly people that they support and he was going to collect money now to see who would be able to support those elderly people my thought was that those 70, 17 elderly people are basically his large intestine, his small intestine and his pancreas and all the different parts of his stomach because his God was his belly. After that, there was a long ride where we got to see lots of beautiful scenes. We passed by uh, lots of grasslands, lots of forestry looking areas. And also, we got to see many parts of Uganda, of course, that we'd never seen before. After a long drive of about five hours, we reached in this area called Chigumba. Yeah, we reached uh, Shigumba and uh, that is a place where the bus stopped and uh, spent like 20 minutes for people maybe to go for a short call or someone wants to rest and relax since it is a long journey and some people would buy things. Yeah, and also you relax, you come out, then you go in again. Right, we're here in Chigumba, which is about in the middle of Uganda. We're still traveling on the bus to go through there. We're actually right about the cup. It's going to be an interesting natural site, the Karuma Falls. It's very interesting to see that on our passing as we go through there. We passed by uh, waterfalls and dams. We passed by a lot of beautiful sights.
The trip was actually very long. It was longer than I expected. It was longer than we were told it would be by Winnie. Winnie, of course, had made this trip multiple times in the past, and so we were expecting it to only be like nine or 10 hours maybe, but it turned into 12 hours, and we get near Pader, so we're told by Winnie, I asked her, are we near, are we there yet? And she said, just 10 minutes, one hour later. <laughs> are we there yet? 10 minutes. <laughs> it just seemed like the, the trip never ended. Finally, we reached in Padera, and it was very dark when we reached there, it was 8 p.m. Welcome to Padera. We are happy, we are free safely. God is good. That's the wonder for us. Thank Thank you for your the so how was the trip? So hectic, we traveled. So hectic, but also at the same time enjoyable. Yeah, that was so fun. We started at 8 a.m., reached the place at 8 p.m., so it actually cut off any soul winning time we might have had that day. But I think it was better that way, because as a result we were able to spend more time connecting with Winnie's uh, family, which allowed us to build a bond with them that would allow us to stay there and effectively minister in that region uh, through the next few days. We've never been in that place before. The good thing we had Winnie to direct us, because if it was the first time we reached in a strange land and we don't know anyone, no one knows us, it could be a bit difficult. So I was saying, okay, it's, even if it's already night, but uh, we have Winnie with us, she knows the area and she can direct us where to go. That night it was a very good gathering because Winnie's family was waiting for us, they welcomed us very well. It was really fun also because we got to meet new people. I was excited to see my family members since I've taken long without seeing them. We were welcomed by all the family. And it was very nice to see her greet her parents and to have a, the relatives of Winnie, her brother and uh, mother and so on, to greet us very warmly, even though they don't even know who we are. Winnie had talked about us and uh, explained things about us that were going to be coming. But well, we didn't know who these people are, but they're very uh, receiving of us. Kind of like the Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, when Jesus sent out the people to go preach the gospel, he would say that when you go preach, that you're going to receive, people will receive you into their houses. So that was also our philosophy. We wanted to eat whatever things were set before us, and also we wanted to uh, try to stay in the same place and not move around. That first evening, we sat down together in one of the smaller huts, the guest hut of Winnie's mother. And we had a discussion that centered around all the people groups in Uganda, uh, primarily, and it was very interesting that what we've noticed in Kampala is also true in the villages that people have a very strong sense of tribalism. That even though Uganda is one nation, yet it's composed of many different groups of peoples that kind of are not directly related to each other in every sense. And so therefore the Acholi people, which is the place in Padera we are, represented by the Acholi people, was the tribe of, or people that we were staying among. And so Winnie's brother, he began to tell us some interesting stories and we began to talk about uh, the kind of uh, lore of the Choli people. One such story was told by uh, them which describes the origin of their people and the origin of uh, other peoples around them. This is the story that everyone in northern Uganda, mostly the parents always tell their children when they sit around fire, they tell them how they came to exist in that place. There were two boys called Gipin and Labon. Gipin and Labon migrated from South Sudan into Uganda in 1800. And the first place they settled is uh, Para. Para nowadays is called Masindi. And it was in this place that one of uh, the brother by name Gipin took the spear of uh, Labon without permission. Then he went hunting. Then as he entered into the bush, he happened to get an elephant. He stabbed the elephant, but the elephant did not die. The elephant escaped with the spear. He tried to chase, but he couldn't manage. Then he came back home and told the brother the fortune of the spear. And then the brother told him, what I need, it is the spear. And then uh, Gipin said, I cannot recover that spear. But the brother said, I want that spear. Then the Gipin was like, maybe let me uh, make for you another one. Then he told his brother, Gipin, this spear is an ancestral spear whereby we always pass to a generation. And in most cases, the spear always belongs to a elder brother. 
and this time around Labon was uh, the elder brother so he just told his brother what I want is uh, the real spear the, the real one I don't want any other formation of spears because that was an uh, ancestral spear that they pass from generation to generation so what you can do Gipir go back to the bush we need that spear the brother went to the bush and he looked for the spear but it took long inside the bush for many days risking animals uh, risking thorns there is no water there is no food maybe he was surviving with the fruits of the land then it happened uh, when he over moved from uh, the forest he got some home in the bush and then he, when he entered into this family he, yeah, he greeted them and they welcomed him then he explained his intention of being in that place he told them I, I lost the spear and it is the reason why I'm moving up and down then they told him we don't know really the spear you want but we have very many spears here that we are always getting from different types of animals maybe you can come and shake on if uh, in case you also have you, you are here then when Kipin entered the house he shaked through all many spears and he got exactly the spear he was looking for he was very happy then uh, these people gave him when he was leaving the place the woman gave him the beads he said okay you can go with these beads because that time around all those years the beads were so so vital in the culture uh, of africans so this man walked away with the beads when he reached home he gave the brother the spear and they continued staying as a family but time came the child of Labon swallowed the bead of uh, Gipir and then Gipir came to know and the information reached to Labon that your child has swallowed the bead of your brother then uh, this time around Gipir also revenge he said I want my bead then the child took long maybe they gave something to to drink such that can vomit but the pressure was too much on Labon because Gipin wanted the beat so Gipin said please you forgive me there is no way I can recover this beat then the brother was like what I want is my beat then uh, the man decided to kill the child in order to pick out the beat after killing the child, they removed the bead and they gave Gipin the bead. One particular war you could have learned from that story, of course, was that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. This man who demanded his spear back ended up losing his own child because of the same being reciprocated back to him. And from that time, they became the enemies in a sense that they separated one group from Para went eastward and then one group from Para the current day we call it Masindi went westward the group that went eastward were the people of the current people of Gulu the current people of Pade Kitgum the northern part of Uganda and then the people who went to West Nile they are the people of Kipir who are currently in Pakwach some of them are in zombie. They are lure group of Uganda. The last group of Gipin, or the last group to go into Western Uganda, entered into Congo. That is the last group that entered into Congo. Then the last group that uh, went through the east, entered in, uh, through Busia, the, Jap the Japadolas of Uganda, and then another group entered into Kenya, the last group that entered into Kenya, by then it was called Jokomolo and the Jokowin. Actually, that is the story of uh, the settlement of Luo speakers in northern Uganda. It was kind of funny because uh, everyone wanted to be in Acholi that evening. Even uh, Joshua Yibali, one of the soul winners on our trip, 
he was, uh, we were all introducing ourselves, saying uh, who we are, where we're from, and he began to say, even though he's from the west of Uganda, has nothing to do with the Acholis, yet he said, and I think that, you know, I have some Acholi in me. So everyone wanted to be at Acholi that evening, because that's, of course, where we were. And therefore, we were all in suspense. What in the world was about to happen? What, we didn't have any time to preach the gospel because we got there so late. So what would happen tomorrow as we go soul winning all day? Are people going to receive us? Uh, are people going to be interested? Are people going to be desirous of hearing? Uh, will it be cold reception? Will it be disinterestedness? And so we were very in suspense about what exactly God was about to do. There are two places that we would be working from while we're on this short-term mission trip. The first place was Winnie's house of her parents, her mother and father, with many huts all around, very traditional African village home. And the other one is uh, a more modern compound open around in the middle of the town where we begin bringing people to for our discipleship lessons. You might wonder, how are we living there in the village? Were we sleeping in a hut? Well, yeah, actually the women were staying in the hut, but because there weren't enough places for us to be able to stay all in huts, the men were staying in a guest house. And this guest house, like most places in Uganda, uh, is much smaller, doesn't have as nice amenities as maybe a, a hotel in a Western world, or even a hotel in Kampala. But nevertheless, it was a suitable living arrangement for us. We just wanted to be able to uh, sleep there and uh, uh, to get ready there, that way we can go out and do the real work of preaching the gospel and doing the things of God. Our goal for each day was to preach the gospel for many hours and in the evening of every day to schedule all the people who had been led to Christ to come for a discipleship lesson on Tuesday and Wednesday and then to come for the church services we were holding on Thursday and Friday. One big difference between a country like uh, the United States of America and Uganda is that there is a lot more government oversight of the things that are going on. And so in order to be effective, you have to comport with the laws of regulation, you have to get clearance for things you're going to do. Uh, and therefore what we did before we started preaching the gospel on Tuesday was we very wisely, I think, went to the mayor, we went to the resident district commissioner, went to the local councilor, all these government officials, and we were able to get a document uh, signed, stamped, dated, uh, explaining what we're doing and that we have the permission to do it. As we were soul winning on that first day, different people had different experiences. Some people had very receptive encounters with uh, uh, the population. Some people had very unreceptive encounters. Some people were very successful leading 12 people to Jesus. Some people were very unsuccessful maybe having one or two people. Uh, and this is actually, again, very similar to what we saw in Kampala. Some days are good for some people. Some days are bad for some people. Well, the first day of preaching was interesting because of the fact that it showed me that people all over Uganda are very, very similar to each other. And Actually, here in Kampala, we have a very great sampling of the entire population of the country, which would have been an indication to us that basically wherever we go, we're going to find people of a similar temperament. The Bible says that God fashioneth their hearts alike. I was so excited about soul winning, mostly because it was a market day, and being a market day here in Uganda, people are always usually many in that area. So it was a market day and I was so excited for so winning. The people I met, they were so receptive and they were loving, they were welcoming. You knock to the girls, I was doing both door to door and the street preaching. You knock their door, they welcome you, they give you a seat and they listen to the gospel. So it was receptive for me. The most receptive day of so winning was the first day. And I met this Catholic girl, she was coming from a staunch Catholic family. So I preached to her and she gladly received the gospel and she was wearing like two rosary, like a rosary and the other tiny thing. So I was like, so after you believe in Jesus Christ, what you have been worshiping is idols and everything. I didn't, I didn't use a lot of words to explain to her that what she's wearing, to rebuke her, to reprove her that this is an idol, you should remove it, I fight with her. That didn't happen. 
but actually that girl like she really amazed me like after i told her that what you're wearing is an idol it's a false god and everything she decided to cut the rosary herself and she removed it most of the religious leaders in Pade district were called to to have a, a meeting in Kampala. So the day we were traveling to the village, it was the day they were traveling to Kampala. And because of that, we got an opportunity because people from Northern Uganda, they always listen to religious leaders so much. So when in their absence, God opened for us the, the way to preach the gospel and people were receptive. We did not even expect. And the good thing, people spoke English. Uh, which really prompted uh, a good number for the first day. This is for the first time in Pade. Uh, in the beginning it was not uh, as we thought, but later it became interesting because uh, people will come to us, they will come to the gospel. In regard to soul winning, it was like plowing, a very hardened ground. It took me hours to win just a soul, just one soul, hours. But God be praised that after some good hours, like three hours, I got a soul warned into the kingdom of God. And I was so happy. I remember telling John that, John, I'm so happy to have won a soul in this part of the country, the northern part of the country. In the beginning it was a little bit difficult, but uh, then people started receiving the gospel massively. And uh, uh, there was no uh, much rejection. In the beginning, I tried to preach to many people and they did not want to listen to me. But after most of the people I was talking to, they were receiving the gospel. Even if they did not really believe in the end or they refused to, uh, to acknowledge that their church is lying to them. But most received, actually. And uh, that very day, I preached to a woman called Jackie. As I, was uh, 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 as I was preaching to her, she was very receptive, listening to me. And in the end of the gospel, when I told her, can I lead you in a short prayer, just to tell Jesus that you believe in Him, she, she said, yes, of course, and she kneeled down. I said, no, don't kneel down. You can stand, you can just stand up. She said, no, I have to kneel down. <laughs> she kneeled down, and then <laughs> I led her in a prayer. Most people wanted to listen to what we had to say, probably because it was some new thing, and they were kind of curious, what's going on? What are these people doing? What's happening here? And as a result of that, the first day, was actually our most successful day of soul winning. We saw 97 people led to Jesus. What was even more interesting than the amount of people who got saved that day was that every day we said we were going to bring people for a discipleship lesson, bring people for a church service. So all of us, after, like is our custom, after they get saved, we don't just say, we're glad you're going to heaven, see you in heaven, but rather we take their information, we take their phone number, we figure out sometimes where they live, and therefore we can do follow up on those people. And we told all those people, you need to be in church tonight at 5 p.m. That way we can all learn the Bible, learn the Word of God. We're going to teach a discipleship lesson on eternal security. And I was very surprised that evening that although we only had 97 people profess faith that day, we had 17 of those people come to church. It was very amazing to see this many people come to church immediately. It was very inspiring, very encouraging, very moving to see so many people leaving what they're doing, leaving their plans, and uh, coming to learn the Bible from people that they've never met before, from people that they've never seen doing this before. I'm sure the kind of evangelism that we're doing is not done there. I'm sure that all they hear, if they hear any kind of preaching on the street, is some false prophet, some Pentecostal preaching his lies through a loudspeaker. So this is very unique and very interesting to them, and therefore they said, let us go see this sight. Let us uh, turn aside to see uh, why the bush is burning and not consumed. Why well, they want to see the presence of God. They want to learn the God. They want to learn the Bible. They want to grow in Jesus. They're hungry for the Word of God, like newborn babes, desiring the sincere milk of the Word that they may grow thereby. I uh, came across this individual who I heard listening to Christian contemporary music out of his headphones. I immediately stopped him and he was happily desiring to listen to me so I took him to a bench. But of course because I had been getting quite little sleep over the last few days and especially on the trip and as soon as we got there my time of sleeping was not necessarily very sweet to me. The uh, time that I was preaching to him I was basically becoming very very heavy with sleep and I was very hard-pressed to be able to explain the gospel to him without 
<laughs> my eyes falling down and me being unable to think. What a, at the end of the preaching, I realized that he was very receptive because then he made this interesting statement to me, and I was just going to give him the tract and just, oh, God, I'll come here or something, whatever. And let me go to sleep for the next, three, next two days. <laughs> and then I'll see you all on Friday or something. <laughs> but then he said, hey, can I go preaching the gospel with you? And then I woke up. <laughs> I couldn't sleep at all for the rest of the day. I was really, I was really awake. And then I re-preached the whole gospel to him. And then he got saved. And he came tonight. And he's going soul winning tomorrow. <laughs> Sometimes bad things happen. You're like you're getting kind of agitated that you're wasting your time. But I, it was interesting. There's an MTN service center uh, really close here. Uh, and my MTN just stopped working because I renewed the visa and I had to redo it. And then I, even though I did it, it's to stop working today for whatever reason. So I had access to my MTN to be able to make calls. So I go to the MTN service center, and it's like they don't have their head screwed on straight or something because they don't know what they're doing. And the guy says crazy stuff to me. You got to go to Gulu and see them or something. <laughs> I said, what in the world? And I got to make calls to people uh, of MTN and say, hey, uh, turn on my, my line. It took a long time. You, you wisely left me early when I, <laughs> you would have been waiting there for a long time. At the end of that time, I said, you know, I'm going to redeem this time. I'm going to make sure that the person who's assisting me gets saved, or at least they get the gospel. So I preached the gospel. His name was Francisco. I preached the gospel to him, and he gladly listened to the gospel. In the village, they have a lot more time than the town. They have less customers. He got saved. Very receptive. He came tonight, too. Yeah, we, we went to that. We were, we were knocking doors, and then uh, there is one woman I preached to. She came this evening, and... Uh, we went behind and I was preaching to another one. After preaching the gospel, she had a rosary. I said, this rosary, you know, it's, I turned to Exodus 20. I show her that we should not make you any graven image, and she understood. I said, now, do you know what you have to do? She said, uh, I, she doesn't know. I said, now you have to remove it. She removed it. And I said, we can break it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> the Bible said, "Dash and I make a day, any graven image. God will be happy if we break it." She said, "Yeah, let's break it." <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we took the rosary. I said, "I asked her now. Uh, let, let's ask this uh, little Jesus on the on the rosary if, if, if that guy can talk, huh? because <laughs> the real God should talk." And then I was like, you know, <laughs> making fun of that thing. Hello, the thing is not talking. I, I put it down, and then I smashed it. When I was smashing the, the rosary, everyone around was like, oh, oh, oh. And they, they were screaming to the woman in the in Acholi language, mm. telling her to leave, leave, leave. And then she left. She went in the house. And then there is one person Joshua preached to, who told the, the girl, come out. These people are preaching the truth. These people will deceive you here. Come, come. And they preached to it. She came back. And then I said, okay. I show again the Exodus 20 and said, Do you understand this verse? He said, Yes, I understand. Do you fear these people? You fear what the Bible says. Yes, I, I fear what the Bible says. So you believe what the Bible says, right? Right. So this rosary, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, if then, Nehushtan be a god, uh, let him save himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I told her. I said, If it that was it, actually God, why? Let him plead for yeah, himself. Why that thing is not pleading for itself? And so people, people like mock right. this. Like, how can you, how can you, it's the, it's the mother of God. It's, it's Jesus on a cross. No, it's Satan on a cross. It's not the true God. It's a false it's God. Just, it's yeah. a demon. Because Jesus is not on the cross. Yeah, Jesus is not on the cross. Jesus anymore. is risen, risen from the dead. dead. Yeah, and the Bible says that which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils. But they, but they make to themselves images of four-footed beasts and creeping things. And they became pain in the mouth. There goes the rock, smiting it down. Watch, watch this video. This is crazy. It's so calm and so sedate. But that's what Paul the Apostle did wherever he went. The Bible says that when Paul went into a place, they were worshipping the great goddess Diana, and he said, that this our craft, said the, the goldsmith, the silversmith, this our craft is now in danger. Because basically wherever he went, the people who were making these idols, they get put out of business. So all the rosary makers will be out of this. And his mockery of, of the idol is just like Isaiah, it's just like the psalmist. They do the exact same thing. They Eyes have eyes, they, they cannot they see. see not. They have ears they can't hear. They have hands they can't handle. They have feet they can't walk. Yeah. Exact same thing that the Bible says. But the Bible says my people are destroyed from back. Hours before I met that elderly man, a friend of mine, Rita, had approached him to get him to listen to the gospel. 
But it seems like the old man was in a rush on his bike, so he decided to go somewhere. And then, after like an hour, I think, when Rita had already left, he came back. And I saw a man looking around, looking around, trying to find someone I saw, I thought. And uh, that's when he saw me standing. And then he said, young girl, come here. And then I went to him and he said, there was another little girl who tried to talk to me hours ago and I was, I was busy, I couldn't listen to him. Do you know what she was telling me? And I was like, I told him, I know what she was saying, let me show it to you. Then I took him aside and preached to him the gospel and he was really, really glad. This disciples lesson was amazing. <laughs> people were saying, new people were saying, amen. <laughs> 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 yeah, they, got, they got saved three hours ago. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>
and then we had to pick like as many as we wanted the ready the ones which are not ready now what was interesting about this particular a plot that they found was that there were many many ants soldier ants very vicious ants all over the place and so in order to get the mangoes from the tree the tree is of course very high it's very hard to grab things sometimes you can jump up and grab a mango but they had to climb up the mango tree and they had to shake the tree's branches that way the mangoes would fall down there's actually a very famous saying here in Africa that if you want the mangoes you have to shake the mango tree you have to put a lot of pressure on the tree in order to be able to get something good out of it namely a big basket of mangoes and so therefore this teaches us something very profound and so important which is what we were at that moment doing in Kpeder not just in a fruit way with mangoes but also in a spiritual way we were putting high pressure on people doing a lot of follow up doing a, a lot of soul winning really pressing people to come uh, into the house of god that it may be filled yes i remember also i remember i and john walking to this large compound that was owned by this old widow woman who had lost her husband some years back who had many children she was a staunch catholic by the way she looked because she had a rosary around her neck and I was so much uh, disturbed whether we would get the family saved. But thank, thanks be to God uh, that he was able to confound this lady. And eventually we preached to uh, his sons and daughters who eventually got saved. Even in our presence. This got me excited because uh, God sometimes can blind the hearts of different men in order for them not to be a stumbling block towards the salvation of others. Wednesday, we had high expectation because the first day we, we were really successful. We said on Wednesday we are going to do even double. We got a lot of people saved. We got many new disciples. So on Wednesday we're going to get double. Uh, that day, uh, when we went to preach, again also, it was also receptive. But in most cases, uh, sometimes the challenges that we were meeting, there are some people, maybe I would say uh, some percentage of people who couldn't speak English. Because not every time we meet someone who speaks English, some of them were speaking uh, their native language. And when you don't know how to speak the native language, it might be a challenge to you, and then they might not listen to you. They might not pick what you are saying. They might show you uh, uh, a sign of uh, uh, like rejection. So uh, on Wednesday we preached the gospel and also still got uh, people got saved. One thing I noticed that everyone in the town knows me and everyone is trying to pick a conversation with me. So I could find it hard. Why? Because everyone wants to talk to me, like everyone almost knows me in the town. If I try to approach someone to preach the gospel, they'll be like, oh, Winnie, don't worry, I'll come back. Let me just go there. And then I end up preaching to a few people because they always just want to talk or they don't take me serious. What happened was there was a bit of a calamity that occurred before the discipleship lesson about an hour before. In May is part of the rainy season in Uganda, and so the storm clouds started to brew and there was actually a big torrent of rain that came down about an hour before the discipleship lesson. And whenever it rains here in Uganda, people often don't carry umbrellas, they often don't have their jacket with them, they don't expect the rain, it can come unexpectedly, very suddenly. It makes the roads, especially in a village area where most of the roads are dirt, it makes the roads to be very difficult to walk on, very slippery, very muddy. And so it really discourages people from coming to church. But nevertheless, we had 13 people come to church. Eight of them were new. Something that's really important to understand about Uganda, and especially that place in Padera where we were, was that certain people, although they are busy about doing something, it might be difficult to stop them. But at least in some cases, those people will stop, and they will actually drop everything they're doing, and they will come to church. There was one man I preached the gospel to. His name was Michael. And I preached to him while my brother John was teaching the discipleship lesson. And after he got saved, I said, we were very close to the place, I said, hey, why don't you walk with me? Let's go to the discipleship lesson right now. He had just got back from his security job. So he said, yes, let's go. And he was very excited, very interested to come for the discipleship lesson. Not only that, but he even went soul winning with me the next day. 
and got to see how to preach the gospel and learn how to uh, turn people to the Lord. Now on this particular day of Wednesday, it was my turn to be able to teach the discipleship lesson that evening in the location which we had uh, designated what we're going to be uh, teaching our discipleship lesson from. And because that night I was teaching on salvation by faith, I knew that as I always whenever teaching on this lesson, we were going to get a lot of people who were going to hear it and fully comprehend the truth of the gospel by hearing it. However, there was a very special instance that day where right before I went to go begin teaching the lesson to a small group of people which incrementally got larger and larger, there was this individual called Bosco who I said, well I just have a few more minutes, let me preach to one more person, met him and began explaining to him the message of salvation. So as I'm sharing with him the gospel, I realize that he is just not going to understand what I'm saying and he just continually uh, keeps having different hurdles and difficulties in comprehending what's being explained. So I say to him, you know what, as right as, as soon as I've just run out of time, I'm going to go teach right now, right here, about this very subject. I want you to come with me and listen to me teach this. That way you can understand how you can be saved and how by believing in Jesus you can enter heaven. He said, okay, let me do that, but let me just first go to my house very quickly and then I'll come right back. And I said, okay, for sure, whenever someone tells me something like that, you don't expect to ever see them again. Go to my house means uh, I never want to see you again. And let me give you an excuse to basically make you think that I actually care about what you're saying, but I'll go. But I just simply said, okay, well, you know where to find us. So as soon as I began teaching, I noticed that right as soon as we started, he showed up, sat in the very front row, took the paper, sang really loudly, looked up, smiled the whole time, and when I was teaching about how Jesus died on the cross and the thief on the cross was saved by faith or for other such like things, he was nodding furiously, saying amen, getting very excited about the truth that he found there that day that we could be saved by the simplicity that's in Christ just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and got saved that evening hearing the uh, gospel being taught through the lesson of salvation by faith. So we continued uh, knocking doors, but there was this particular home that we went to. So me and my colleague were passing by and we happened to see this extremely old man sitting there with his radio and he just, he looked so depressed, he looked really sad as if he, has, he had lost all hope or as if he's just, it, his expression was really saddening. My colleague told me, Rita, why don't you go and preach to that man, that old man? And then I told him, I cannot. Most of these, actually, most of these, of these old people are Acholi speakers, and I cannot preach in Acholi. If I start preaching in Acholi, I'm going to take one or two hours preaching to one person. And so, I, then, and then I told him, let's just, so, let's just go. Let's continue with our soul winning. We shall get other doors to know. So, however, when we moved like eight meters away from this man's home, I felt a conviction in my heart. I imagine this man being being desperate right now with that expression I saw I imagine him in hell this man burning in hell old as he is he's burning in hell and screaming out my name and I imagine myself being in heaven hearing this man scream my name and say Rita you refused to come and preach to me you denied me the gospel so I, I felt really bad that I just I am bypassing a man who also deserves the gospel just like anyone else so I, I told my colleague, let me, let's go back, let me, let's go back. I'm going to try to preach to this old man. So when I went, I went to him, uh, I tried to preach to him. I started, by, I, I talked to him in English, and he, he, he knew a little bit of English. He could hear English. So I, I started to preach to him, and he, he was really receptive. He was, he was answering, but he could not understand what I'm saying. If, it is, if I'm to get someone saved today, let it be this man. At least let him get saved from hell. Then I asked him, so do you know, do you know, do you know English? He said, I, I can hear you, but I can't uh, talk back, I can't respond. So he, then I was like, so uh, I know actually a little bit of actually, so I'm going to try to preach to him actually, but when I'm, I'm saying something wrong, please make sure you're correct. Then he's like, yeah, that's a better idea, I love that. So I preached to him and I'm, I'm speaking broken actually, I'm saying things he's not even understanding, then he's the one correcting me was like he was preaching to himself. Me not knowing actually, I, 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 I asked him if I can lead him in English, he said no, you have been talking actually, so use the same actually you've been using. So then 
when when I was talking to him and actually I basically made a bad statement and I said uh, I am going to hell <laughs> and then he said no 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 I don't agree me I'm not going to hell I have believed in Jesus Christ I cannot go to hell, <laughs> I cannot go to hell. And then, and, then, and then I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right, you can, you're not going to go to hell, you can never go to hell. He's like, yeah, like, you, no, you're the one who has just shown me that I can never go to hell. Again, you're saying things which, which you're like showing that I can lose my salvation. Haven't you seen what the Bible says? <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, no, it's because of the actually that I can't speak well. And he was, he was like, I'm so happy about him. So this guy, uh, he was like, he can't walk. <coughs> All, really old. So he asked me, so now that now this truth that I have learned today, I would love to others also to receive it. So what should we do? What should we do so that other people also, people like me, can also receive this free gift of salvation? What must we do? What must we do? And then I told him, I told him, people who have strength, like people who have strength and they know this gospel, should go out and preach the gospel. So he said, yes, people should go out and preach the gospel. You should continue doing what you're doing. Rita, do not stop preaching the gospel. Even if it means going to prisons, even if it means going to hospitals, there are very many people out there who have lost hope. You see me here, I had lost hope. I have actually, you found me, I am actually just waiting for my death. I'm waiting for the day that I would just die. And I, I would just die because I knew there was no hope for me at all. But this, you have really brought light into my life. If I, even if I die right now, I do not mind because I know where my soul is going. I'm going to go straight to heaven and I'm going to go with the Father. So that is why you should not also stop preaching the gospel. You should not stop showing others how to go to heaven. You should go out, go everywhere, get your friends, grab everyone, grab your family, everyone you know who knows this truth and who believes this truth. And you go and preach the gospel. Do not let people go to hell. Do not keep the gospel to yourself. very excited because now we're going this evening have our church service we're going to actually have a big church service where not only do we invite people who came to church discipleship lessons on Tuesday and Wednesday but now all of us who are actually preaching the gospel all of us who are part of that team out in Padere we're actually going to join the church service and it's going to be a big group of people so we suspect it it's going to be a large group of people hearing the Word of God and uh, giving service to the Lord Something that was very concerning on this day, which we saw from the previous day, which came to be on this day also, was that the number of people who were led to Christ reduced again. This day, the total of all of our soul winners, all of us going soul winning for six, seven hours, only got 63 people to profess faith in Jesus. And what I think started to happen was that people's newness and the uniqueness and the curiosity started to wear off. Also because a lot of people were being reached with the gospel. Remember that this is a place that has at most two or three thousand people. And if we preach the gospel, give out gospel tracts, try and turn the people to the Lord, at least half the people for the entire time we have preached the gospel to. And very likely that many of the people that we had been preaching the gospel to began to speak about us. And gossip spreads a lot faster in a village than in the town, in the city. We found so many kids coming, pupils coming from their school, and we had some preach to, some were not getting it very well. And nearby, Winnie told us that that was the school she went to. Let's go. So this is where you started from? Yeah, right here. When was that? I was uh, from 2005. Because we left Kalongo. My primary one to four was two, three was Kalongo. And we came back here from primary four to seven. Here. <laughs> Oh, it's so fun. So, oh, were you like to, a bright uh, student? Uh, they used to beat us here. <laughs> <laughs> when you come late, they put you down and they kill you. 
So because there was a cloud, we had to take shade at Winnie's school because of the rain. When Winnie showed us her school, we had some traditional music being played, like with the local instruments, like the piano, local piano, local xylophone, the local guitar and the organs, everything. So we went inside the music room and we found a very little boy playing. He was so talented that he was playing almost every instrument which was in the room. He played the guitar for us, he showed me how to play the piano. I got the piano, I couldn't believe it. It was like a wood, a board of wood with some metal on it. But it was magnificent because of the sound which was coming from it. It was so calming, so nice. I'd never seen such instruments in my life. So Thursday was, in my opinion, a personally very successful day for the for the gospel of Christ, where we could, I believe that it got furthered more than anything, because on that particular day, uh, a couple of the people who had been coming for the lessons the last other days, Bosco and Ivan, both showed up at the same time in the early afternoon and actually were helping us a lot because the people in Pader, although most of them spoke very good English, needed at times a person to use a word in the local language of a choli to be able to cause them to fully comprehend the meaning or the significance of what we were saying. So they would be helpful in explaining the gospel to people around and we got lots of people saved and both of them seemed like they were basically just on the verge of being able to themselves bring people into the kingdom. They were very excited and very glad to be able to join in the work of evangelism and it was never before uh, that I think that people who had just gotten saved a day before, a day earlier, would immediately begin grabbing people and beginning to make these people understand the gospel and when I'm explaining uh, that salvation is just through believing alone and then the person is misunderstanding or being confused they immediately begin to explain to their fellow uh, town person how they could just understand that salvation is just by believing. Ivan John's disciple I went with him so winning on Thursday John gave uh, him to me to go with him like so as he can witness me preaching the gospel and he can pick up like some few things from my preaching also. So I went with him and he took me to all of his friends, all of his, like most of his family members to preach to them. Like he tried preaching that day by the way. On this day of Thursday, I met someone named David. David was a UPDF soldier, which means he was in the military of Uganda uh, and he was working in Somalia. And sadly, uh, he's in his early 30s, sadly while he was working in that place, he was in a car, a vehicle of the military, and it got blown up. Uh, and therefore he had a big problem with his leg and with his body, and he was discharged for a while. And uh, that's when I met him. He apparently was suffering from a lot of uh, depression, suffering from a lot of uh, uh, sin and so on. And he was very interested and excited to hear the gospel. And he basically said to me, I want you to change my life. I want you to come to my house, preach to my wife, preach to my children. I want them to get saved too after he got saved. And he came to church that evening on Thursday evening, came to church again on Friday. He even got baptized also. So great stories of people that their lives were hurt by sin, their lives are hurt by warfare, wickedness, evil, temptation. And yet God is able to restore those people. God is able to bring joy and happiness to them because of the gospel's power. At that first church service where John was preaching, he preached a powerful message about the burden of the Lord. So the first thing Jesus Christ tells us about his burden is that it is basically God's burden. That means, like he says, it's my yoke. It's a burden that is meaningful, as opposed to the world's burden is something that is vain, has no significance. And you can do labor in the very fire with all the things that you do with the world and spend all of your strength for naught. We had, if you count all the people who were there, both Winnie's family, uh, the soul winners on the trip, and the new people and recurring people who came, it was a number that exceeded above 30. And so we told everybody that we want you to come back uh, for the final church service. We want you to come back for the final time where we're going to be preaching the gospel here in Pader. And uh, there was a great sense of urgency in our souls as we were going to sleep that evening. We just have one more day. We may never come back to Pader. We may never come back to this place. We need to preach the gospel with all fervency. We need to get as many people saved as we can, do as much as we can, turn as many people to Christ as we can, and bring as many people to church as we can. And also because on Friday was the day we're going to have all of our baptism. We're focused on our mission. We had to finish. And we're even super motivated to go for the next day. So today is 
the grand finale. Today is the final day we're in Pader. What was going to happen? What was, we were really hoping, we were really praying to God that God would open the door to the people to come to church and that we would have the biggest church service that evening. We wanted to beat the record of Tuesday of 17 new people coming. We wanted to see how many people can come, how many people will arrive, that we, as many people can hear the Word of God, as many people can be established in the Word of God, and many people can be baptized and uh, added not really to the Lord in salvation, but also be added to the to the church of God and uh, perhaps become a nucleus of people in Pader who will faithfully serve God even after our departing. There was a great sense that we only have a few moments left with these people. Jesus said, yet a little while is the light with you. It was a hard day because as Pader is a very small city, people already knew us very well. As we're walking on the street preaching the gospel, you meet people that don't want to talk to you because they know you already. Like five people already preached to them or they preached them like two times or three times to meet them on the road. I know you guys, is what they say. So, but we got people saying, there, there, there were people who were ready to receive the gospel so that day. So on that day, on Friday, we actually were experiencing the most opposition uh, that I experienced on day. People on Friday, they seemed to be the least receptive. People were shank, shaking their head, disinterested, not wanting to hear the gospel. I was with Maria. Then we, end, we were door to door so winning. Then we met a family, children and few elders who were matured. We were preaching. They welcomed us home. We started preaching the gospel to them. Five minutes after, a man came in. I think it was the father of those children. He started speaking in our local language. And then my partner, Maria, didn't know the language, but I knew the language. The man was talking, screaming. I kept quiet. I wanted to give a room to Maria to finish preaching the gospel to the boy he was preaching to. But he was screaming a lot of rebuking bad languages. Now he had Maria was not really responding to him because Maria didn't even understand what he was saying except me. And he turned to English, started like, where are you from? Who gave you opportunity to enter my home? This is my house, this is my home. He wanted like to even beat us. Well, I told Maria, you know what, let's go. Rumors went in a different perspective of what we are doing. But those who really knew the, what we are really, the gospel we are preaching, they were saying, no, these people are preaching the truth. And there was even something <coughs> fascinating that happened to me, and I used to work in pest control, but, uh, and I would sometimes get rid of beehives, but I, we had one time we were preaching the gospel, I was with Gideon, uh, and we were standing in front of a shop, John and Angela were preaching the gospel and they had just stepped away. And as Gideon was preaching the gospel to somebody, uh, there was this massive swarm of bees that just out of nowhere, real bees, they started to come. And uh, they, there was this kid riding a bike and apparently they start stinging him and so on. So he falls down and runs away. And everybody in front of the shop, the restaurant, this place over here, uh, they're all screaming and yelling. And I think, what in the world is going on? And immediately I start to hear so I hear the bees, and then uh, we were with actually uh, someone that I preached the gospel to uh, that had a, 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 a problem, yeah, uh, and with able to move, he couldn't run. So I was I was ready to run, but you know uh, we had to bear the infirmities of the weak. The Bible says so. We helped him, and I, Gideon, the guy, of course, that Gideon was preaching to, just took off. <laughs> so I, I, we, we ran inside the restaurant, and they were closing the door on us. They wouldn't. They didn't want us to get inside the restaurant to hide from the bees. And then we had to like beg them, please open the door. We don't want to get stung here. And in the process, Gideon gets stung in his mouth. And, <laughs> I think I didn't get stung, you know. But I don't know if I'm allergic to them. I've never been stung by a bee, you know. And then uh, uh, we, we finally get back to this back area, back in the restaurant, and then it leads to this residential area that we came to. And it was so funny to see the hysteria of everybody. Because it wasn't just that bees were coming, they were surrounding us. It was like we were being circled by sharks or something, because we would try to go out, and then we hear this, and we come back. Then we go out another way, and then we hear bees, they come swarming us, we go back. And everybody was laughing hysterically, because this is just a crazy experience of like all these bees for like 15 minutes torturing us, terrorizing us. And then finally, the bee swarm stopped and it subsided and Gideon and I with uh, uh, the other guy we ran as quickly as possible uh, to get as far away from those bees as, as we could 
and uh, we continued preaching the gospel. This day, many of them are actually a little scared, and they start to be afraid of what we're doing. So we're out preaching, and we met, for example, a couple of young women that said, we're not allowed to listen to you. And I said, what? And they said, we can't talk to you at all. We don't want to hear what you're bringing. And that was not just simply one isolated incident, but there were many people that were basically afraid, saying that these people are basically coming and bringing some new, what new doctrine is this, or what are they doing? And people had a lot of terror in them about the new teaching that was being brought to this place because it's never been heard before. It's a, it's a true gospel that never sounded to these people, but just like the Bible says that it was preached unto you as it is in all the world, that's what God expected of the gospel, that it would go in all places. So, and here, people, at least with hesitancy, started to uh, wonder at what exactly was going on. Just like it says in the book of Acts, when they were preaching in the day of Pentecost, people uh, came together uh, hearing the wonderful works of God and they were wondering what all of it meant. It was very encouraging to be able to see all of the soul winners on this trip doing a tremendous degree of follow-up. Some people going to other people's houses, usually making calls to the people and trying to get people to come to church doing a tremendous degree of follow-up that like Paul says, let us go to our brother and see how they do. Let's not just preach the gospel to them and uh, let them rot or preach the gospel to them and say, oh, if they're interested in the gospel, if they're interested in the church, they'll come to church. That's not true. We have to put pressure on those people. We have to call them. We have to lovingly pursue them. We have to be like the man in Luke 15 who goes out and seeks his sheep. And when he finds his sheep, he grabs them, puts them on his shoulders and walks back rejoicing. We have to be like the woman who, losing her coin, sweeps the whole house and finally finds the coin. She says, Rejoice with me, I have found my coin which is lost. We have to be uh, actively seeking these people and trying to bring them to God's house, trying to bring them to learn the Word of God. We uh, had this uh, constant discussion about what would be the best way that we could baptize people. So we need to figure out a way, but actually in Padere, there's no place where you can baptize easily. Although there are unclean, very murky places, very shady places to baptize in, it's probably not safe in terms of your health. Maybe there's snakes in that water. So we don't want to do that. Plus those places are pretty far away from where we were. It would take an hour at least of walking to that location. And then I came up with the idea saying that we can dig a hole and fill it with water and then we baptize people there. It was time consuming, so we could not do that. There was this big water tank at the guest house that we all the men were staying at and so my brother John said hey why don't we you know hire that why don't we rent that and empty it out clean it out and fill it with good clean water and baptize people in that we all said oh, that's crazy there's no way we we're gonna say how can you dip people in a black tank but actually that turned out to be the way that we baptize people the only way that we could effectively and quickly baptize people I met this individual on a bike he was riding very speedily but uh, as it were, I wanted to go join myself to his chariot, and I stopped him, and he, and uh, fascinatingly enough, as a great turn of events, his name was actually Philip. So he stopped his bike and listened to the gospel and got saved. Now, after that, I realized I still have a little bit more time, about 30 minutes or so, to preach to one more person. So I told him, hey, what are you doing right now to Philip? And Philip said, well, I'm not doing anything. And I said, well, hey, can you just listen to me preach the gospel to another person? He said, sure. And I said, hey, and after that, can't you come to church with us? We're having a church service. Well, yeah, I'm not really doing anything, said Philip. So then he listened to me preach the gospel to this young Catholic woman who turned from her idols and got saved. And he was very amazed and asked me a lot of Bible questions about heavenly rewards and about uh, the second coming of Christ and all kinds of different things, having a desire for the things of God, having received the love of the truth, he now wanted to continue on in the, in the things of God, uh, grounded and settled, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So I actually took him with me, and we walked together back to the church service, where, or the place where we're going to have our church service from, and there I found that the water tank that we had set up was not completely filled. To my dismay, I realized that if we don't get involved very quickly and begin to fill up the tank a little faster in the different means or different way, then we're not going to be able to immerse people inside of this tank. So immediately I took uh, Angela and this new disciple Philip, and instead of going and filling a few more jerry cans from the, the little uh, tap where they were filling it from, which was right about to run out actually, we took uh, each of us two jerry cans and Angela one, and we went to the a borehole or the place where they well where they draw water from the ground. And so we <laughs> made the trek there, it was only about 10 minutes, 
And I had never drawn water before like that, nor had I ever carried jerry cans for very long amounts of time. But this was enough jerry cans to be able to finish off the, the uh, water tank so that we could make sure we properly dunk people inside of the water. And so then we filled up the water over there and we made a very long trek back. It took at least three times the amount of time to get back as it did to get there because of how heavy the water was and carrying it all the way. But we finally got back and we emptied the water inside of the vessel and it was enough water to be able to cause people to be dunked inside of the water tank. That evening in the church service, the grand finale of this trip, we had at least 22 people from before Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and a couple new people coming. Some people brought their friends, at least 22. It might have been even bigger, so it's very difficult to count when the number gets so big. And it was a great spirit because this was the biggest church service that we had that evening after only four days of preaching the gospel. 22 people in church. What an amazing result. I was preaching a sermon, really with a salvation sermon, the all of your righteousnesses telling people that you cannot trust in your own righteousness to save you. And he's talking about how we are so wicked and evil that God caused this punishment to come upon my nation, God's nation. But he says the reason why God's bringing us back or why he would bring us back is not because of our goodness. His wrath lies hard upon us, he says in the text. Why? Because we are all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. It was an amazing church service because not only at the end of the church service was there a tremendous degree of people, but there was a tremendous degree of commitment and devotion. Most people there did not want to get baptized. We were telling them, hey, we want you to get baptized. The Bible says, be baptized, Acts chapter 2. Why tarriest thou? Be baptized. But the people didn't seem to be interested in getting baptized. The people didn't want to get baptized. They were kind of hesitant. We don't really know you very well. We're not sure. But after the church service, my brother John got up and he really powerfully explained to people, you need to be baptized. At the end of the service, church service, I knew that many people here are probably going to be somewhat resistant to baptism and therefore I felt like it was necessary for me to explain to people the biblical injunctive to be baptized and so I began explaining to people with as much uh, zeal as I possibly could how God commands them to be baptized and how there's no objection or reason why they should not be baptized so Part of that was because of the fact that I had a desire for these people to, as they had received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And just like the disciple is not above his Lord, nor the servant of his Master, so these people should not think they're better than Jesus and they should get baptized. But also because it was really painful to fill up that water tank. And I didn't just want to fill it up for nothing. He took away all their excuses, took away all their problems, and he very put a lot of pressure on these people that this is what the Bible commands. And you want to be faithful to God. Take that step. You took the step of salvation when you put your faith in Jesus. Now take the step of service by deciding to get baptized and being faithful to the Lord. Where God would say like he did of his, Jesus Christ, he will say, this is my beloved son or this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased when you get baptized. God will be well pleased with you if you get baptized. But if you walk away from here, your only opportunity to get baptized uh, and we're going to leave here, uh, woe unto you because God gave you this perfect opportunity right now for you to show faithfulness to Him, commitment to Him, devotion to Him, love to Him. What does hinder me to be baptized? And he said, if thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. Meaning that if you never believed in Jesus Christ as you now do, you were not baptized. You just got wet. If you got baptized in a born-again church, Pentecostal, if you got sprinkled by the Catholics, or if you got water poured on you by the Church of Uganda, the Anglicans, you were not baptized. Meaning, Jesus Christ commands you in Matthew chapter 28, baptize them. Acts chapter 2, Peter said, be baptized. Acts chapter 9, Ananias said to Paul, and to you tonight, be baptized. And now, he said, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. That's what the Bible tells us. Although not everybody got baptized who was there, yet about half of the people who were there said, I'm going to be baptized. I'm not going to tarry any longer. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are nobler, things that are higher, these have allured my sight. And therefore, uh, we had great joy in many people getting baptized that moment. Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank <laughs> you.
And as people were being baptized, there was so much happiness inside them. There was so much joy. You could see they were so excited. And even though they were soaking wet, we didn't have any towels for them. They didn't have a change of clothes. Yet they were staying around for five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes after just to take pictures with us. I just want to remember this very important, very solemn occasion where they committed themselves, not merely uh, trusting in Christ for their salvation, but committing themselves to serve God and to follow Him in believer's baptism. When everyone left to their homes, uh, since it was the last time that we were going to, the last night in Pader, we gathered uh, around the fireplace. 320 people being led to Christ over the course of this time. 35 new people coming to church. Seven people of those going out soul winning and preaching the gospel with us and nine people getting baptized. This was a great success. So we had a big celebration with a goat dinner. Uh, and we were all sitting around for this time. Usually we were sitting inside this big hut where we were having discussions and having our evening meal, just like Elijah, eight in the morning, eight in the evening, God sent him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. Or well, the Israelites, they went out to collect the man in the morning, had the quill in the evening. That's how we ate on this trip. And so this night we actually sat outside. The moon was extremely bright. It was a very, very, very bright moon. And also there was a little bit of light uh, from other sources. So therefore we were able to see and there was a little fire pit that we created and we all sat in a big circle singing hymns uh, joyfully from memory. We were uh, talking about the great things that God had done on this trip and we got to eat that beautiful meal, come and dine. So what I learned from this so winning trip to Padea is that we really have to go and preach the gospel to people all throughout the, the world. The world needs to know the gospel, the world needs to get saved, the world needs to know Jesus. What I have learned is that people are completely alienated from the truth. The false gospel of this world, the Pentecostal, the Catholic, they have really corrupted people. They don't know the truth. Like you preach about Jesus' salvation by faith, they will be like, what is this? So what I've learned is that we really need to go and preach the gospel to people. And if God willing, God could, uh, the church could get more funding and support. We really, we do more so winning trips like this one so that a lot of people could get saved. There are three very important takeaways, three very important lessons that we learned from this Padera mission trip. The first one is the rarity of the gospel. It's astonishing that for all of our time here in Kampala, almost four years, we find practically no one who believes the gospel. That this entire country is given over to heathenism, paganism, and although it is supposed to be over 80% Christian, yet all of those Christians for the most part are totally gone out of the way. They do not believe the true gospel. They're in false religion. They don't have Christ. That is not only true in Kampala. It is also true in Padera. In Padera, we did not find a single person who believed the true gospel. There are supposed to be thousands of people preaching the true gospel here in Uganda. Where are they? That's my question. For all of the money that's being sent to Uganda, to all these missionary organizations and all these people, where are the people who actually believe the gospel in this country? We don't find it, we don't see it. It's like everything has to be totally restarted. We have to be like Jeremiah, who had to pull down, pluck up, destroy, build and plant, and build a completely new foundation of Christ here, like Paul said. Why is it that we find wherever we go, no one's saved? No one believes the gospel. No one understands salvation is by faith. No one realizes that once you're saved, you're always saved. Nobody believes the true biblical doctrine of how to be saved. Why is that the case? It shows us that the gospel is very rare, even in Africa. There are so many people out there that don't know the gospel. When I went to Pader, I realized that the gospel needs to be preached everywhere in the world. When we reached Pader, people were surprised or they didn't know this gospel. They didn't know that salvation is only by faith in Christ. So there is a very great need of preaching around, especially Uganda here, like in 
different villages, not only in the town, because people say that they go to villages and preach in them. Surprisingly, they don't. But they need a true gospel because many people are being deceived. Even the current preachers who are in that district, they are all false teachers. They preach lies. They just preach for money. In fact, they don't show people the realities. But they need a lot of people who are supposed to go and settle in that place. Actually, not only Pade, most part of Uganda needs preachers. And this time around, the biblical preachers. This continent needs mission trips like that. There are many places here in Uganda where it has never been touched with the gospel. They, they never heard about the gospel. Uh, this is just the tip on the iceberg. So this country or even this continent need the real gospel because there are many false teachers who are preaching their salvation by works and that you have to repent, pray, and be good to go to heaven. But they need this real gospel, the gospel of salvation by faith alone. Once saved, always saved. The second lesson we learned from this mission trip to Pader is the power of the gospel. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And so the gospel, wherever it goes, it has a tremendous degree of power and influence. It's able to change people. It's able to turn people to righteousness. It's able to turn people to understanding the truth. They who are in darkness, they who are in complete lies, they who have been taught false things for their entire life, 15 years, 30 years, even some cases 60 years, and yet one presentation of the gospel can slice through all of that. That was true here in Kampala, it's also true in Pader, and perhaps anywhere you go in all of Africa. The gospel is so powerful, so amazing, that it can grip people, it can change people, and transform people. No other explanation is sufficient to be able to explain how in just four days these great results can happen. Before we went to Pader, we had a big prayer meeting with all the people. That way we can make sure that God's spirit and power was upon us. Just like in the book of Acts, they had a prayer meeting, Acts 1, Acts 2. They had prayer meeting, Acts chapter 12. Because we didn't want to trust in our own might. We didn't want to trust in our own power. We don't want to trust in our own ingenuity and our own skill. We wanted to rest upon the hand of God and take hold of His strength and be able to make peace, uh, reconcile these people to God. The idea that we were being given from different people, if you go to my village, everyone's going to basically fall down before you like Lycaonians and offer sacrifice to you. They're going to want to hear the gospel so diligently and, uh, and so assiduously. But that's actually not true. Uh, the reason why is because Kampala, the capital city of Uganda, attracts people from all over. We should have known this before anyway. Kampala has every people group of Uganda and others outside of Uganda, Congo, South Sudan, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, so it has people from all over East Africa. And these people are people from the villages. These people go back to the villages very frequently. And so these are the same people, and therefore we shouldn't expect there to be uh, any barrier to the gospel just because we're inside of a city as opposed to being in a more rural area. It's not about the area. We often complain there's the grass is greener on the other side. That's not true. The reason why we were able to have so many results is not because we went to a better area. The reason why we had so many results is because the gospel is just that powerful. It's able to melt the heart of stone and change the left of spots. I learned uh, one great thing of, about preaching the gospel. So, the more you go preach the gospel, the more you become more bold. I learned a lot of things that is to to persist, like to resist and to shake the mango tree. <laughs> like, uh, you know, some people owe us so winners, sometimes you get discouraged to give up. But as long as you persist and you preach to them the word and you go and at least you can take one hour as long as that person is receptive, you will get a lot of food. People we preach to, we really need to follow up on them because I too, someone followed me up. That's why I'm in church making phone calls to them so that they can come to church and be and they train them and secondly I learned to be persistent on what you do doing things with all your heart because when we were in Pade really everyone was focused on what we are doing if I compare when I'm in Kampala I have a lot of things I run here and there work what but this time it was only soul winning so I learned that I, when I'm focusing 
doing something, I do it with the whole heart and you get the result perfectly. You cannot accomplish anything without work. You have to work hard. Many people, even secular people, people who are doing secular jobs, they become successful because they're doing too much work. So even in the things of God, if you want to see results, we should do work. Jesus also was, was a man of work. He was working hard. The whole day preaching, teaching, and in the night he's going to pray. So Jesus was not someone who was giving time of, to sleep, like sleeping all the time or just relaxing. He was someone who was doing work. If we do work, we go somewhere, we we'll get a lot of people saved. But if we sit down, we'll not do anything for God. I learned that we should not give up on following up on the people that we preach to. Whenever we preach to someone, we should make sure we call them, we should text them, we should check on them. If we even know where they stay, we should go and check on them and see how they are doing. What I learned in this village is that the gospel of Jesus Christ works in any place. The only thing about the gospel is that, not that it doesn't work, but that the people who are preaching it don't work. You see, the Bible tells us of the gospel that uh, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And so, in order for someone to be able to be effective preaching the gospel, they just have to be doing the work of an evangelist, or doing the work of preaching the gospel. But the reason why many people may not get saved, or the reason why many people do not change or come to the house of God, the reason why many people are, are not seen, like as in the book of Acts, being added to and causing the church to multiply uh, God's house is because of the fact that God's people are not doing the work. And so over there in Padera, I noticed that, as I've been saying, people are all very similar to each other. And all it really takes is the same gospel going to a different people to bring the same result of winning many people to Christ and causing those very same people to consecrate themselves to the service of the Lord and so that there is no difference whether Jew or Greek, bond or free, Jew or Gentile, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And so it is also, whether it's from the north or from the east or from the south or from wherever else, from promotion cometh neither from any, promotion comes from on high. And God is the one that uh, ultimately, by the means of the preaching of his gospel, will effectually cause people to believe in Christ. And then uh, by the, when they choose to believe on him, God can change their lives if his people, who are called by his name, will go out and do the work of preaching and go out and do the work of following up on those same people that they preach to. You can't have fruits, you can't have souls if you just sit in one place, but rather you must go, as Christ says to his disciples after his resurrection, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Again it says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The third and final lesson we learned from Pater is the opportunity of the gospel. There is an immeasurably vast amount of people, millions upon millions of people, with open arms, ready to receive the gospel message. But the problem is not that these people are unreceptive, not interested, someone's already preached to them. No one's preaching the gospel to them. They don't have the gospel. They're like the Macedonian man that is right now pleading with us, saying, come over into Pader, come over into Gulu, come over into Imbali, come over into Imbarara and help us. And they're pleading for assistance, for someone to come and tell them the true gospel. And if somebody would just go and preach the gospel, then they would get saved. If somebody would just go and explain the gospel, then they would have eternal life. But it's so sad that the majority of those people who right now, if the gospel was offered them, they would get saved. In all of Sub-Saharan Africa, if you offer the gospel to the hundreds of millions of people, I believe tens of millions of them would get saved. But the reason why they're going to go to hell, or the reason why, sadly, they might go to hell, is because people are not preaching the gospel. Jesus Christ gives his one prayer request specifically in Matthew chapter 9. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So we need more people preaching the gospel, the true gospel, effectively here in Kampala, here in Uganda, here all over Africa. It's summertime, friends. Look on the fields. They're white, all ready to harvest. There are people ready to receive the gospel. We just need to go out to them and preach the gospel. They which sat in darkness indeed have seen a great light as it came to Padere and as it continues to come to all of Africa. Therefore, we're not going to stop. We're going to continue preaching the gospel of Christ. We're going to continue preaching the word of God. We're going to continue bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to all of Africa.
<laughs> Maria, what were your initial thoughts? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Go, we have a little bit of time. Okay. All right. Say <laughs> <All right. laughs> stolen waters are sweet. Say it. All right. <laughs> and mango eating in the Mango eating in the It's you. It's I. <laughs> so winning in Pade was so great on my side. Why am I saying this? So winning the first day was something nice. Okay, why am I saying it was nice? <laughs> just as I just as I'd lost hope and hope and what Joshua. I'm a one word woman. I don't talk a lot, Joshua. I don't talk a lot. I just say yeah and nice. Four and verse 26. Your righteousness is. What was the other point? <laughs> and it's really funny to see this. Oh, thank you. See anything? Uh, thank you. What was the second thing I knew? I said it last time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what did I know last Here are three things. <laughs> <laughs> I knew something else. His wisdom failed him. <laughs>